Welcome to this quick review on the thorax, the lungs, the pleura, and the mediastinum, including the heart. The material I'm presenting in here is not supposed to replace anything that you are supposed to take away from the lectures or the lab sessions. It is supposed to be a supplement and a high yield one too. Let's start off by having a look at the ribs. Now we have true ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs. We start off with the true ribs, you can see we have ribs number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are all called true ribs. They're called true ribs because these ribs really truly attach to the sternum via their own costal cartilage. And we have false ribs, which are going to be ribs eight through ten. These ribs don't attach to the sternum directly via their own costal cartilage, but they attach to the costal cartilage of the rib superior to them. Then we have ribs that actually don't attach to the sternum at all, which are going to be the floating ribs, which are rib number 11 and 12. So now let's have a look at the intercostal muscles. We have three layers of muscles in between the ribs, and from the superficial to deep these would be the external intercostal muscles, then you have the internal intercostal muscles, and deep to this, if I hide these two here, we should see the innermost layer of intercostal muscles right here, which is also called the intercostal intimus. One note here, as you can see, that these muscles don't seem to be spanning the entire um, gap or the entire width of the intercostal space. This is actually true. The external intercostal muscle Note the fiber orientation is as if you have your hands in your pockets. Yeah, The fingers would be going diagonally from superolateral to inferomedially. Yeah, the external intercostal muscle turns into a membrane. The, four, uh, the more medial you get, actually, here is the intercostal membrane, actually ex external intercostal membrane. And so if you are close to the sternum from the anterior approach, you'll actually not find any external intercostal this close to the front, but you'll actually have direct view right after the membrane onto the internal intercostal muscle. Okay, so here's the external intercostal, here's the internal intercostal, so let's hide this one, and now we're going to hide the internal intercostal muscle, and note also here, the fiber orientation is perpendicular to the fiber orientation of the externals. Okay, if I now hide the internal intercostal muscle, and we rotate a little further laterally, here is the innermost layer of intercostal muscles. Okay, um, another note about this here, when we dissect out one of the intercostal spaces, Remember the mnemonic for the order of structures, which would be van, because the order is going to be veins, arteries, and nerves. Let me just highlight all these things all in one for one moment here. So if we have a look at the intercostal space, and we look from superior to inferior, we should first have vein, then artery, and then nerve. That's exactly what we see. Here's an intercostal vein, here's an artery, and here is a nerve. So, most protected in the costal groove is, for some reason, the intercostal vein, and then the artery, and then the nerve. This is an important thing to remember, this order. Down here you have collateral, artery, nerve, and veins. Uh, it's important to remember that order if you have to do an intercostal nerve block, for instance. Okay. So now let's make our way into the thoracic cavity. For that, we're going to remove the ribs and the intercostal muscles, at least virtually here in the lab. We will be cutting through the ribs and cutting through the clavicles and just removing the whole chest plate. And there's actually another muscle that pops up here, which is called the transversus thoracis muscle. Yeah? So this is actually on the deep surface of the chest plate. When the chest plate is removed and you have a view of it looking from the inside, then you can actually see this muscle very well. There's also an important artery and vein running on the deep surface of the chest plate, which is the internal thoracic artery and vein. They will be running straight down. Let me see if I can display these. Here's the right internal thoracic, also called mammary artery. And here's the right internal thoracic or mammary vein. Okay, the internal thoracic artery actually is derived from the subclavian artery if we follow this superiorly here. See, here's the subclavian artery and it runs on the deep surface of the chest plate 
all the way down here until it then bifurcates into two arteries. One of them is the musculophrenic artery, and the other one is the superior epigastric artery. Superior epigastric artery is going to be important for us later on because this is the one that anastomoses somewhere around where the umbilicus is with the inferior epigastric artery. You know, the concept that when there's a superior something or a major something, there would be respectively an inferior something or a minor something. So once we've removed the chest plate, then we can explore the thoracic cavity and we can see that we have two different types of pleura. Yeah, visceral pleura, for instance, as we can see here on the right lung, is directly adherent to the lung tissue itself and cannot be peeled off. Parietal pleura, which I have left in place here, it is slightly transparent though, um, is actually not adhering directly to the lung tissue. It is an additional layer that covers the entire surface of the pulmonary cavity. So this parietal pleura is going to be named according to where it's going. So if ribs are called costa, we will call the pleura that is adjacent to the ribs costal pleura. If we have a look at the middle region, which is called the mediastinum, the pleura that will be adjacent to the mediastinum would be mediastinal pleura on both sides. In the cervical region, we would call the pleura cervical pleura. And note this little thing here. If we have a look at the extent to where the lungs expand, they actually expand higher than the level of the first rib. This is an important clinical thing to know if you think of injuries to the thorax and injuries that occur superior to the first rib, you can actually see that the apices of the lungs extend beyond the level of the first rib. So I'm going to go ahead and hide the parietal pleura on the left side as well. Let's step back for a moment here and we can admire the lung, the right and the left lungs actually, in their entirety. And you will see that you have three lobes on the right side and you have two lobes on the left side. You have an oblique fissure here and on the right side you have an oblique fissure and a horizontal fissure. Horizontal, paralleling the fourth rib and oblique. If we have a look at the extent of the lungs inferiorly, we can look all the way down into these recesses between the lungs and the diaphragm. So we can actually dive really far down into here, and that is called the costodiaphragmatic diaphragmatic recess. We have one on the left, and we have one on the right. I'm going to hide this muscle here. This muscle actually, FYI, is the serratus anterior, which is innervated by the long thoracic nerve. I'm just going to throw this in here because the serratus anterior is important. It prevents winging of the scapula. When the long thoracic nerve is injured, the patient will present with a weakness and a winging of the scapula on the injured side. On a little side note here, I would really recommend checking out the 3D Atlas, which is also part of the Anatomy TV package that you have access to as a student here at UAB. Using this Atlas, you can actually get some more information than you would get just by using the 3D real-time. Here, for instance, you can review the surface anatomy of the lungs. You can click on different structures. You can see you have your superior lobe, your oblique fissure, your inferior lobe, the apex of the lung, and with every click, you actually highlight a certain structure and it'll give you further information on this. You can review the medial surface of the lung. Here's the medial surface of the left lung with all sorts of labels that show up here for you to know. Note please the orientation of the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary artery versus the main bronchus. And if we have a look at the right lung here, you can see your three lobes, the superior lobe, the middle lobe, and the inferior lobe, which are of course divided up by the corresponding fissure is the oblique fissure and the horizontal fissure. So now let's have a look at the heart. So we're going to continue now with the mediastinum. Okay, so the heart lies in the mediastinum. It is right in between the right and the left lungs. And this is actually a pretty nice view because you can appreciate one important thing, which is also an important landmark. You see right here where the trachea then bifurcates into the right and the left main bronchi. This is the sternal angle, which clinicians sometimes refer to as the angle of Louis. 
which occurs also at the T4-5 intervertebral disc. I'm going to have to remove the lungs and the bones, and I'm just going to try and give us a very good, clear view of the heart. So the reason the heart right now looks a little transparent is because it is actually still sticking virtually in its pericardium here. So if I highlight the pericardium and actually hide it, we can see what is supposed to be the main surfaces of the heart. And you can see that most of the anterior surface of the heart will be taken up by the right ventricle, and only a little bit would be part of the left ventricle. Right here. If we rotate this into a view where we can look down at the aortic and the pulmonary valves, you can see right here the right heart valve, which is a pulmonary valve with its three cusps. And here is the aortic valve also with its three cusps. The right and left valves actually have both right and left cusps, only that the aortic valve has a posterior cusp as well, whereas the pulmonary valve has an anterior cusp and also a right and left cusp. It may be that it's going to get a little busy now because I'm going to add in the arteries and the veins. So now with the arteries and veins added, let's have a look at some of the main coronary arteries and cardiac veins. Let's start off here with the LAD, the left anterior descending artery, which is also called the anterior interventricular artery. This here actually comes off of the left coronary artery. Let's see if we can fly right in there. Here it is. And the left coronary artery also gives off another branch, which is here, the marginal or obtuse artery. And it gives off the circumflex branch, which wraps around, as the name suggests, and I've highlighted it here. You can see a little bit of it, not very well though. So the LAD runs together with the great cardiac vein. Yeah? So the mnemonic for this is great lad. Great cardiac vein, left anterior descending. The right coronary artery comes off of the aorta right here, and it gives rise to several branches, one of which is going to be the marginal artery. And also for this, there's a mnemonic device which is called small margin, because the marginal artery goes together with the small cardiac vein, which is also called, as you can see here, the acute vein. And then if we look at the posterior surface of the heart, there's one more important large branch for us to be able to identify, which is called the posterior descending artery. or also synonymous with the posterior interventricular artery, and that runs together with the middle cardiac vein. So the mnemonic for this is middle PDA, middle cardiac vein, posterior descending artery. So now let's quickly review these vessels again, but we'll do this in 3D mode. So if you have these 3D glasses, go ahead and grab those. I'm gonna switch us into the 3D anaglyph mode. There we go. Okay, we will start off right here with the anterior interventricular artery, or the LAD, left anterior descending. Note how it comes directly off of the aorta. Right up here, and it's a branch off of the left coronary artery. In addition to that, the left coronary artery also gives rise to this branch, which is the left marginal or obtuse artery, and then this branch that kind of wraps around here, the circumflex artery. The circumflex artery passes along the left part of the AV sulcus, and terminates at a region called the crus of the heart, which is the junction between the AV, intraatrial, and atrioventricular grooves. Let's not forget that if we have the great lad that is part of the left coronary artery, 
the LAD is going to be accompanied by the great cardiac vein. Here's the great cardiac vein running together with the left anterior descending artery. Now let's have a look at the right coronary artery. So here's the right coronary artery getting filled directly off of the most proximal part of the aorta up here. If we follow this inferiorly, we can find some of its branches. The most important ones for us to know are actually indicated right here. The right marginal artery that runs together with the small cardiac vein. So the mnemonic for this was small margin. So if we follow the right coronary artery around here, we can find another branch which goes inferiorly on the posterior surface of the heart, which is the posterior interventricular artery. So the PDA and the PDA runs together with the middle cardiac vein. So it's middle PDA. Okay, so now let's continue our review of the heart using the primal 3D atlas of human anatomy. You can access this through the same interface on Lister Hill Library as you did the 3D interface. Here this is organized slightly differently. You can peel your way through layers and go down a layer. See, I've just removed some of the coronary arteries and veins. Yeah, and you can go up layers as well. So if I go all the way up here, you can use layer 10, for instance, to review some of the arteries and veins, yeah, here's for instance your great cardiac vein running together with the LAD. So now let's work our way a little further down. If we have a look at this view, we can look right into the right atrium. And within the atrium, you can see the interatrial septum, and this region down here would actually be the fossa ovalis, which is a remnant of the embryological foramen ovale. If we have a look at this section now, we can see up here is the pulmonary valve yeah, and the pulmonary trunk. Then we have over here the anterior superior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. This, as the name indicates, has three cusps. Here we have some papillary muscles, anterior papillary muscle. Here's the interventricular septum. Of course, you're going to have a moderator band as well, which I don't think is actually shown right on here. If you want to have a look at only the coronary arteries, you can have a look at them in this image, this is layer number one, and you can rotate this freely 360 degrees all the way around. So you can appreciate the right and left coronary arteries, where they're coming off of the aorta, and of course, all of the branches that are coming off. Maybe you could have a look at this here for a brief review. And of course, you can add in the veins as well. So here, let's have a look at the left ventricle. This is a nice section right through it. You can see in the left ventricle you have your papillary muscles again. Here's a posterior medial papillary muscle, and here's an anterolateral papillary muscle. So let's have a look at the left ventricle. Here are your papillary muscles. You are going to have two papillary muscles because you have the mitral valve, which is a bicuspid valve. Okay, here that is. Here's a little bit of clinical stuff about it on the little text box we have here. Here's one of the papillary muscles, and here's the other papillary muscle. So here's a quick review slide. If you go onto the Slides tab, you can see here's a review for the heart. Of course, you can see your right coronary artery coming off here. Here's the right marginal vein and the marginal artery. Here's the LAD, the great cardiac vein, arch of the aorta, your superior and inferior vena cava, your right atrium. The left atrium is going to be slightly hidden behind here. Looking from a posterior aspect right here, you can see your superior and inferior pulmonary veins that are draining into the left atrium of the heart. Yeah, here's the left ventricle and the coronary sinus is going to be running right along here, which will empty into the right atrium. Having a look at the inside of the heart, here's your bicuspid valve. Attached to the valves on both sides are the chordae tendini, which attach the valve leaflets to the papillary muscles. Here's your left atrium, the left auricle, the left ventricle, the papillary muscles of the right and left ventricles, the right atrium, the right auricle, the right ventricle, the tricuspid valve. So this has three cusps, so correspondingly it will have three papillary muscles, the IVC, the pulmonary veins here, pulmonary veins on the right side, some subpericardial fat 
and the superior vena cava. Here are the atrial conducting pathways. The AV bundle is located right here. It's also called the bundles of Hiss. The bicuspid valve is over here on the left side. The chordae tendini are highlighted right now, attached to the valves respectively. Left atrium, left ventricle, papillary muscles in the right and left ventricles. Purkinje fibers, which of course we did not see in lab, but this is the approximate location of those within the right and left ventricles. The right atrium. Let's have a look at a cadaveric specimen here pulmonary, aortic, and mitral valves of the heart as viewed from above. Here's the right cusp of the pulmonary valve, and here's the left cusp of the pulmonary valve, and here is the anterior cusp of the pulmonary valve. Note that with the pulmonary and aortic valves, you will have right and left cusps on each valve, only that the pulmonary valve has an anterior cusp and the aortic valve has a posterior cusp. Here's the left cusp of the aortic and the right cusp of the aortic valve. Correspondingly, you also have the origin of your coronary arteries from where the left and right cusps are actually originating. Here's the mitral valve. Here's the superior vena cava. Now we'll have a look at the right atrium opened up, viewed from the front and right side. Okay, right there where the little arrow is indicating this is the location of the coronary sinus where it empties into the right atrium. Located here is the crista terminalis. You see crista terminalis is at the end of where these pectinate muscles are. It is a, a vertical ridge of muscle that connects to the pectinate muscles. Here's the fossa ovalis, which is the remnant of the foramen ovale. This is the location of the right auricle. The inferior vena cava would be attaching right here. The interatrial septum is located in this area. These are all pectinate muscles. The AV node would be approximately here. The superior vena cava would be entering here. The tricuspid valve is located over here. The valve of the coronary sinus is where this little arrow indicates. And the valve of the inferior vena cava is located right here. We have a look at the right ventricle now opened up. We can see several structures. Here's the anterior papillary muscle. Here is the anterior superior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. Here the chordae tendony of the tricuspid valve. Here is the inferior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. Over there is the left ventricle. So you can see that in situ, in the human body, most of the anterior surface of the heart is going to be made up of the right ventricle, if you look from the front. Here's the posterior papillary muscle. There is the right atrium. Here is the right auricle. There is the right ventricle. Here's where the IVC will attach, and here's the SVC. And this concludes this video. I hope you enjoyed it.